which Henry, with some justification, regarded as the key to conquering Scotland. This arranged marriage turned into an enduring love match. A pendant, the Lennox jewel, probably given to Margaret by Lennox, survives in the royal collection as testimony to their love and devotion and their dynastic hopes. Sadly, of their eight children, only two survived in the museum. Henry, Lord Darnley, and Charles, later Earl of Lennox. Through this marriage, Margaret, a determined and feisty political operator, became deeply involved in Anglo-Scottish politics. Under Mary I, she emerged as a staunch Catholic, and she was prominent at court. Queen Mary, her good friend, wanted Margaret to succeed her, instead of the Protestant Elizabeth, the bastardised half-sister, whom Mary feared. But Parliament would not hear of it, and as soon as Elizabeth became Queen in 1558, it became clear there was no place for Margaret at court, and so she retired to her houses at Temple Newsom and Settrington in Yorkshire, which became focuses for Catholic intrigues. Margaret clearly did not recognise Elizabeth's title to the throne, and she was ready to subvert the new Protestant Anglican settlement. The enmity was mutual. Elizabeth feared Margaret, as she feared all her female relations of the royal blood. Margaret's chief aim now was to marry her son, Henry Lord Darnley, to the Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots, and that was a plan to which Elizabeth was naturally violently opposed. For her plotting, Margaret endured a long spell of house arrest at Sheen, and she was sent to the Tower when Darnley wrote north in 1565 and married Mary without Elizabeth's permission. Margaret remained in prison until 1567, when the house in which Darnley was staying in Edinburgh and Kirko Field was blown up and he was murdered at the age of 20. And at this point, Elizabeth released Margaret out of compassion. Distraught with grief, Margaret denounced Mary as a murderess, but for all their efforts, the Lennoxes would never succeed in bringing anyone to justice for the murder of their son. By 1572, for reasons that are not clear, Margaret had come to believe in Mary's innocence and the two women were reconciled. To the end of her life, Margaret would remain convinced that the real culprit was the Earl of Bothwell, Mary's third husband. She never found out who really murdered Darwin. In 1570, Margaret's husband Lennox went north to Scotland to Queen Elizabeth's behest and was appointed regent for his grandson, the young James VI, the son of Mary and Darnley. By this time, Mary had been forced to abdicate and James, at 13 months, had become King of Scots. But Lennox's rule proved controversial, stirring up old feuds, and he was brutally assassinated in an ambush at Stirling in September 1571. And that left Margaret devastated with a grief that was described as poignant and her remaining son, Charles, was out of control as a teenager, and in vain did she beg Queen Elizabeth's chief minister, Lord Burley, to take the boy into his house as his ward and bring him under control. And you could just hear Burley thinking, no, not one of that family. Instead, Burley found the boy a tutor who curbed his excesses and discovered the promise in him. But even now, Margaret was busy scheming. In 1574, she joined forces with another arch intriguer, the redoubtable Bess of Hardwick, to marry Margaret's heir, Charles, to Bess's daughter, Elizabeth Cavendish. And inevitably, because Charles, of course, was in line for the throne, that provoked Queen Elizabeth's anger when she found out. Off Margaret went once more to the tower, but she was soon released. And after Charles died of tuberculosis in 1576, she devoted her energies to bringing up her granddaughter, Arbella Stewart, in whom were vested all the Lennox claims to the throne. I should mention that I have my guest today, the historian Sarah Brissett, who's written a marvellous biography of Arbella Stewart, which I warmly recommend. Margaret died in 1578, and shortly beforehand she had died, she had died with Queen Elizabeth's favourite, the Earl of Leicester, and it was claimed that he poisoned her. And if you want to know whether I think that's true or not, and what the evidence is for it, Sorry, you'll just have to read the book. <laughs> Elizabeth, because she was very parsimonious, begrudgingly allowed Margaret a state funeral, and she was buried fittingly in Westminster Abbey, where a fine tomb, adorned with her painted effigy.
refugee and kneeling figures of all her eight children had been built in her lifetime and it still survives today. Later, Mary Queen of Scots was laid to rest in the same chapel. Love had been the great blessing and the great curse of Margaret's life. As she chose to put it, her sojourns in the tower had been not for mess of treason, but for love matters. And like her cousins, she was a victim of Queen Elizabeth's animosity towards her female heirs. Like them, she was in prison, but unlike them, she was freed and managed to retain her position of court through four turbulent reigns. And that meant she was a lucky survivor in the brutal world of Tudor politics. Furthermore, she died in her bed, not by the acts like Lady Jane Grey and Mary Queen of Scots, or in prison like Lady Catherine Grey. And she lived up to what her contemporaries would have seen as her allotted span. And perhaps that's why her story is more obscure than theirs, and why it needed to be told. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.